today, we need to talk about uh, assessment and um, exams and standardized tests. We wonder why, uh, what's happening? Because in the last few months in Hong Kong, there's been a big debate, TSA debate in Hong Kong. And actually, my, my colleague, Hong um, Kong uh, has been working days and night over that all the time. And uh, also, there's another thing, PISA. 2018, there will be some controversial changes, and I'm sure later on Professor Ho will talk something about that too. Because of all these standardized test things going on, assessment um, issue going on, that's why we thought it's such a lucky time that somehow we've got some international academics, important ones, coming to Hong Kong in this time. So we thought maybe we can grab them here and then to exchange, just discuss with us and tell us, give us more perspectives about the, the topic. So. Um, Without further delay, let me introduce our panelist um, and number one, Dr. Stephen Krashen. And Dr. Stephen Krashen is from the uh, uh, University of Southern California. And then we're also very happy to have uh, Stephen Krashen in our first conference in 2014. And the next one, Dr. Christina Erkila. <laughs> for Education and Cultural Services with Espo City and um, Professor <coughs> Mr. Ho and um, the Department of Education Administrative Policy <coughs> of CUHK and then she has been also heading the Hong Kong PISA um, exam for a long time. So and also our moderator, Professor Stephen Chu. always bring a sociology perspective on education, which is great. So, um, also in our audience, we have some very, we are very, very happy to have a lot of members and officials from the uh, Hong Kong Examination and Assessment Authority, and including Secretary General Dr. Um, C.S. Tom. Thank you very much. But you have many, many people coming today. We are so happy and grateful. Thank you very much. So, and we have to thank so many things. Thank the venue, the giver from CHK. Um, sorry, I forgot all the names. And, <laughs> I just let you have the, the stage. So, Professor Chiu, please help me uh, to moderate this session today. Thank you. Well, I think it's best to give this mic. Uh, the, the venue is not decided for this kind of grand event, and I uh, um, apologize for the slight hiccups in the equipment. Uh, but first of all, let me thank everybody here, especially our overseas guests from. Uh, U.S., Finland, Thailand, everywhere, uh, come to this uh, occasion. Uh, we are very glad that Chinese U uh, to have all of you here uh, on behalf of the co-organizers, the Center of International Student Assessment, in which uh, Esther heads and the Institute of uh, Asia Pacific Studies, the Public Policy Research Center, uh, with myself as the director. Uh, we are. Very, very happy to have this opportunity to co-organize this event. So, uh, and I'm, I'm sure all of us in Hong Kong are aware of the ongoing uh, discussions about uh, TSA, uh, the Territory-Wide Assessment System that we have here in which uh, standardized tests have been administered to uh, P3, uh, P6, and Form 3, uh, that is grade 15. Uh, student um, and you know, the uh, Chinese English and mathematics and uh, this is only one of the many standardized and public assessments that we have in in Hong Kong and, and I'm sure Esther will give you uh, a bit more details later and uh, I think that there are uh, there's no doubt about a certain uh, reactions and uh, to this system of assessment in Hong Kong uh, uh, voiced out by uh, some parents. I don't know how many, I don't know uh, whether they are in the majority, they, but their voices are loud and clear and has been heard by the government. And uh, so we is still under review and we are not sure what is the going to be the final result of that review. But then uh, I think the discussion has been productive in a way uh, that uh, the government has heard uh, different opinions and, uh, and academics have varied behind different positions in that debate and uh, also make their opinions heard. 
And so that is a very valuable opportunity for all of us to rethink and reflect on the uses and possible misuses of sanitizer assessment, public sanitizer assessment, uh, especially in primary schools. And I hope that that will also be the uh, focus for us today, uh, from Stephen, from Christina, and, and Esther, to tell us a bit more about the experiences in the US, in, in Finland, and uh, from Esther, from uh, in Hong Kong, and other parts of Asia made public. So uh, I hope uh, after today, uh, we'll all be uh, adding a very important comparative perspective into our discussions and see how uh, other peoples are handling or mishandling uh, this kind of uh, large-scale standardized public assessments in uh, other parts of the world and, and in Hong Kong. So uh, without further ado, let me uh, Ask uh, Stephen uh, first question uh, to be on the floor and, and talk about the experience in the U.S. And uh, he said he is a very low tech person uh, with very very I think very good reasons. So we will be. citizen to tell you that our government is all wrong. <laughs> it is doing things that, is, that are harming children, torturing children, all for the sake of corporate profit. Shall I continue? Okay, good. If you, I'm going to give you a brief history of the last uh, 15 years or so in two parts. The first is from the beginning of it all, NCLB. No corporation left behind. <laughs> That's what we call it, okay? And we'll take that to race to the top and the common core state standards. And notice how I spelled state standards on your handout, because it's all about money. And I'll conclude that this, the history goes up to last month with good news when we were all happy and we thought we had won. But then the empire struck back, and the last month has been a nightmare. It looks worse than ever. You sure you want me to continue? Yeah. Okay. Well, all this started around <clears throat> the year 2001, when No Child Left Behind started, and the reason we had it is because of the widespread belief that our schools are failing. This is no longer a hypothesis this is considered an axiom. Everyone believes it in the United States. Oh yeah, but the schools are so bad, they're so bad. Civilians tell you this, your neighbors tell you this. Why do people think schools in the United States are so bad? There's one reason, test scores. International test scores. The idea is that our test scores are terrible and the successful Countries, I use the word countries, are way ahead of us. You know who the countries are? Shanghai. In the United States, people think Shanghai is a country. <laughs> <laughs> the number two country, Hong Kong. Now, I tell people Hong Kong has not decided if it's a country. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday is part of China, Monday, Wednesday, Friday is not. That's, you know, the impression I get. And after that, the third biggest country is Singapore. No, Singapore is a city, all right, where the working class goes home to neighboring countries at night. Okay, so these are the countries where it's supposedly going worse. <clears throat> when you look at the test scores, I think if I'm one of five people on the planet who has actually looked at the test scores. Not too many people have. It doesn't take long. It just takes an hour or so. 
you see that the United States test scores are not so bad. They're about average, right? You know, 500 mean, a little bit over, a little bit under. Here's the crucial thing. If you control for poverty, test scores, American test scores, are much better. And just to overwhelm you with statistics and numbers, if you look at my, uh, the bottom of page two, I have all the bibliographical stuff. I deliberately made a small print to make it hard to read. <laughs> but study after study has shown this. When you use multivariate analysis and you control for poverty, American test scores are not too bad. They're pretty much up there. They're close to the top of the world. Now, no one in the United States seems to know this. I've been trying to break the world, world record, Guinness Book of World Records, for letters to the editor published. Uh, I've broken the record for letters to the editor submitted, but not published. When I got off the airplane, <laughs> and you will confirm this, I had to finish writing my letter to the South China Morning Post because I read it on the airplane. They can't say that. It was all about testing. Um, tests are good. I said, no, no, not, but I'll get to that. Uh, anyway, why does uh, poverty have this um, influence? Why should it be? And as you know, if you've looked at the research, study after study over the last three, four decades shows that high poverty means low test scores again and again. Several reasons. It means food deprivation. It means not having enough food, not having nutritious food. It means lack of health care in countries like the United States, which refuses to have a national health program. Uh, it means less access to books, fewer books in the home, school libraries not as good, and all these things are very closely related to school success. Uh, the reaction to that in the United States is we need more testing. <laughs> you should gasp with astonishment and disgust. This is the solution. More testing is what these kids need. We need to know more about exactly where they are. No, we don't need more testing. We need better food programs. We need basic medical care. And we need better libraries, uh, obviously. You can have the best teaching in the world. And it's not going to help if the child is hungry, if the child is ill, teeth hurt, can't see the board, and they have nothing to read. Uh, we see my colleague, uh, Susan Ohanian, who's very noble in my opinion, she commented on this with no child left behind. Here's what she said. She said, when Congress passes no child left unfed, no child without health care, and no child left homeless, then we can talk about no child left behind. This is exactly right. Well, what has happened since then? Race to the top. The United States Department of Education has an obsession with competition. We've got to win. We've got to be number one in everything we do. Uh, I've made an analogy between the uh, point of view of the Department of Education and Hunger Games. It is exactly Hunger Games. Pit people against each other and then they'll forget what the real problem is. The real problem is federal government policy and the undue influence of big business. Instead, we're going to compete. And then they went on to the Common Core State Standards, which is doing the wrong thing harder than we did it before. Uh, Ohanian, again, her definition of the Common Core State Standards, a radical, untried curriculum overhaul combined with nonstop national testing. The race to the top increased testing, my estimate, about 20 times what we had before. More testing than we could ever, than we've ever had on Earth. The main point of the Common Core State Standards, I've decided there's one thing, online testing. That was the goal. Let me help you understand this by telling you an old joke that was popular during the days of the Soviet Union. A worker was working in a factory, and every day he would come out with a wheelbarrow full of sand. And the guards thought he must be smuggling something in the sand, so they would inspect it, they wouldn't find anything. Turns out, he was smuggling wheelbarrows. <laughs> this is the point. Online testing is the biggest, <coughs> the, your vocabulary word today is boondoggle. It means rip off, cheat, fraud. It's the biggest fraud, I think, in the history of civilization. The 
public is going to like it because it's high tech. Okay? The public pays for it. If we have online testing, here's what it means. It means that every child in every school must be connected to the internet. It means you must be connected with an up-to-date computer. An up-to-date operating system. Are you with me? Now, I've done my surveys. We need a new computer, all of us, every three years. Because we can no longer upgrade. Because they've made sure it's planned obsolescence. So we need a new computer for 50 million children every three years. That's a lot of money. And every time someone at Microsoft, someone at Apple gets a new idea, they throw it into the system and everybody's got to change. So this is guaranteed profits. We call it the testing industrial complex. This is from Eisenhower, the military industrial complex. This is guaranteed income for the computing companies, the testing companies, forever. And if it fails, which it will, if there's no improvement or things get worse, who gets blamed? Teachers. Right? Say yes. <laughs> it's the teacher's fault. The teachers just don't understand technology. We need to give them more professional development, okay? Is there any evidence any of this is true? No. There is not only no evidence that this will help, but there is no plan to do studies. It is assumed. The United States Department of Education came out with a paper. Every year they do a technology report. The one they did a few years ago say we must push technology into the schools even though there's no evidence for it because the situation is so serious we can make repairs as we go. In other words, let's give people secondhand crap that doesn't work, make some money on it, and not worry about it because we won't be blamed if it fails. I am not exaggerating. I think the situation is actually worse than I'm saying. Well, we had some reactions to this. Oh, well, here's a little bit of evidence that's important. There is evidence, I think I would call it suggested evidence, and I included it in my letter to the South China Morning Post, that teachers' grades are actually a better measure than any standardized test. This is suggestive. This was done, two studies done at different universities uh, with high school students. They looked at grades in classes that students got in their college preparatory class, and they predicted university success. They added to the formula, multiple regression, the effect of taking a standardized test to predict college uh, achievement, the SAT. The SAT added nothing to the prediction. Teachers' evaluations of students is the best measure we have. Think about it. Everybody says we should have multiple measures. Teachers' grades, you've got multiple measures. You've got multiple teachers. You want to take into consideration improvement. Yeah. Teachers do that all the time. Uh, not only that, it's all subjects. And it's close to the syllabus. It's close to the requirements. It fulfills every requirement that the testing professionals give us. Common sense says we would rather have the evaluation of an experienced professional who's with the student every day than a distant stranger who creates a test and the students see it only once and doesn't understand the students, who they are, um, etc. Well, we reacted against this policy. I wrote a paper. Uh, one person has read it, it seems. It's called NUT. Uh, no Unnecessary Testing. Thank you so much. You made my day. Okay. I was hoping someone would read it someday. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> and it says uh, we should have a principle that says we should not test unless no test is valid, it should be given unless we know that it helps teachers and students. That's obvious. And I thought that was a clever thing to say. Uh, and that means we shouldn't give tests to all students all the time. But also, which had much bigger uh, influence, a heroic movement called Opt Out. <clears throat> Opt Out was begun by parents, public school teachers, and a few university professors on zero budget. They have no money. I'm going to their conference now <clears throat> for the third time. I go there on frequent flyer mileage. I stay at a cheap motel and I eat at Subway. And so does everybody else. Okay? 
They started a national <coughs> campaign, national opt-out. I'll tell you who some of them are later. This has had an effect. It spread by word of mouth. In New York State last year, 20% of the public school students eligible to take the test did not take the test. Now when students opt out, big business loses money. But we thought we had won. President Obama, I, I, Obama really owes me, you know, <laughs> personal. I have a bumper sticker on my car that says Barack Obama 2008 written in Hebrew. I delivered the Jewish vote in California, okay? And I generally like him. It's hard to dislike Barack Obama. He's really affable and very insightful, careful. And he's our first president in many years who can speak in complete sentences. <laughs> but his education policy is worse than Bush's. It's that bad, okay? Um, he announced suddenly in October, this is all very recent, that we shouldn't have too much standardized testing. There should be a limit on the amount of standardized testing. Wow. And the Secretary of Education, R.D. Duncan, who was a fanatic for testing, said, maybe there's too much. These are born-again protesters of too much testing. I said, gee, this, this is wonderful. Uh, uh, maybe we should uh, declare a victory here. Then the new law was passed on education, and there was no increase in testing. So at least we kind of stopped it. That, that's amazing. I wrote a letter to the editor to USA Today. Fortunately, they did not publish it, in which I said, congratulations, Mr. President. Let's give credit to the people who made this happen, the opt-out movement, Alfie Cohn, Susan Ohanian, who are the real champions of this movement. Then my friends told me I had spoken too soon. Morna McDermott, Peggy Robertson scolded me. They said, take another look. Look at our blog posts. They were absolutely right. And now we come to the umpire striking back. There was a good reason they got, they want to stop all the standardized testing, calm it down. They want to put in testing, more testing, testing every day if possible. It's called competency-based education. I looked hard, Peggy Roberts, and showed me this. It's in the new law. It's all there. And a paper came out which was very hopeful. This is all in the last couple of months. No rest for the weary, right? Um, the National Governors Association, who has always been on the wrong side of everything, uh, this is a group that supported the Common Core, heavily influenced by uh, the Gates Foundation, Pearson Publishers, the usual people who are responsible for this kind of thing, came out with a position paper. It's quite new. You can find it on their website, in which they talked about competency-based education. They're reviving an old idea. Here's what it is on the bottom of page one. Your coursework in classes will be based on the Common Core, this arbitrary and valid set of standards, provided by and designed by commercial publishers. They are now in charge of the curriculum in the United States. Delivered online, students work individually on computers. You move from module to module, asking, you know, doing the exercises. And you can move to the next module only when you have mastered the current module and you get a little badge to show that you've mastered it. So you have to pass a test. This only works if the goals if what you learn has to be very clear, very discreet, okay, measurable, which means school will only cover things that are easy to test. By the way, the United States has been moving from fiction in the schools to nonfiction, obviously because nonfiction is easier to test. That's all that's behind it. Students take tests when they feel ready, and passing tests will determine student success, teacher ratings, and the school ranking. Now, moving on to the next page where we have more horrors. They say the tests are personalized. You can go at your own rate. No, they're not. First of all, you're going to be evaluated on the test. Your teacher is going to be evaluated on your test. Your school is going to be evaluated. The pressure is on students to move through quickly. How fast you move through the test will determine your teacher's holding her job. Also, oh, you can use different strategies. No, you can't. 
you can only use strategies that are inside the domain of the computer that someone at a computer company decides is a possible way to answer a question. So we now have a perpetual cycle of working through packaged programs and being tested. The uh, other, several organizations are all supporting this. You only see good things about this on the internet. All of them are directly or indirectly supported by the Gates Foundation. In other words, Microsoft. Okay? This is there in the new education law. They announce grants for innovative assessments. They talk about competency-based education. They want computer-adaptable assessments that emphasize the mastery of standards and alliance of competencies and competency-based education model. The common core is not the core. It's the whole thing. It's the entire apple, not just the core of the apple. Everything in school will now depend on performance on these tests. No more. Nothing else counts. That's how they're setting it up. Is there evidence for it? Astonishingly, the National Governors Association admits there's no hard evidence. I quote to you here from their manuscript. Although an emerging research base suggests that competency-based education is a promising model, it includes only a few rigorous examinations and analyses of current and ongoing pilots and similar programs. They say that in their commercial message. They say, we've not, well, not really a lot of evidence for this. Nevertheless, we're going to do it. This is astonishing. This is a pedagogical and intellectual crime of the first order, in my opinion. Um, the timing is very interesting. October 25th, President Obama suggested a limit on standardized testing. Also in October, the National Governors Association paper came out. Also, December, the president signed the new education law, which included a big boost for this whole program. The impact, now we get really depressing. If this is true, we're going to see a huge drop in the responsibility of teachers. Teachers are now assistants to help kids get through these computer programs. The United States spends $600 billion a year on education, kindergarten through grade 12. Most of this is teacher salary, teacher benefits, teacher retirement. If you eliminate teaching as a full-time profession and you reduce the number of teachers, this, this frees up more money for technology. That's the whole point for unproven technology. The companies are responsible for all of this. They're going to supply the software, the hardware, the content, the module, and the test. Of course, Pearson can't wait for this to happen. And here's a place where Pearson has become the leader in preparing these modules for everybody. Here is the sinister plan as I see it. There's an American comedian, Lily Tomlin, who said once, my cynicism is having a hard time keeping up with the times. That's how I feel. This is the strategy. First thing you do, which they've been doing for the last several decades, you tell the public that teachers are terrible. You disrespect teachers. Uh, I've seen this, it's in the media. Whenever there's anything that happens that's scandalous to a teacher, it's in the newspaper. Uh, the sex scandals are the most interesting, I think. It's usually with high school teachers and their students. When they discover that a high school teacher has had an affair with a student, page one. I decided, I did an informal study of this, to compare that to police and priests who are also accused of sexual misconduct. My conclusion, looking at the data, in all three, it is extremely rare. And in teaching, it's the least. Of course it happens, but it's not very frequent. They never tell you how often it is. The other scandal they like to talk about is administrators embezzling money from the school system. Again, how often does this happen? It's very hard to do. There's not that much money to embezzle, as you know. Uh, so they never, they, but whenever they can say something bad about education, they do. Now, once the public is uh, convinced that teachers are no good, and everybody thinks that's true in the United States, they're blaming everything on teachers, water shortage, it's the teachers. Um, this opens the door. In the United States now, there's a great deal of enthusiasm for hiring temporary teachers. 
This is called TFA, Teach for America. We call it Teach for a While. <laughs> Teachers get, college grads get five weeks of training. The person who cuts your hair got far more training than this. The person who washes your hair, if you go to a fancy place, they have more training than this. Okay? And they're college grads, they go work in tough areas, you know, and all this, then they go back to law school or grad school, uh, et cetera. People say they're wonderful young people. No, the research says it's not very good. 50 minutes, very good. I love it. Okay. In state after state, tenure has been eliminated for teachers, what we call due process. No complaints. Seniority pay has been eliminated which means you cannot stay in the profession and make a living uh, after a while, so people drop out. And now we have competency-based education. We, the preliminary thing to that is the flipped classroom, where it's half computer, half this, you know. The problem with all this stuff and technology going in is that it has been pushed as the magic solution for everything. Whenever the new Apple whatever comes out, the Apple 6.5983X comes out, people line up to get it as if this is going to be a new life for them. So people believe that computers are going to be magic for everything. Um, but technology, as we know, has been good. It's been mostly very helpful. My colleague Frank Smith said, computers are one of the best things that has ever happened to the human race. They're one of the worst things that has ever happened to schools. That's been the problem. Take, for example, flipped classrooms, bringing in the computer for half your lesson. If you leave it up to teachers 100% on how to use technology, they know how to do it. They figure out. Let me tell you about my son, who's a professor of mathematics. He, as a professor of mathematics, he has to teach calculus again and again and again and again. It's the bread and butter of mathematics departments. He has figured out from experience that there are some problems in calculus that students always have problems with, some concepts. So he has recorded himself giving alternative solutions to difficult problems. They are available to the students to watch whenever they feel like it. That's it. It's not dictated by Pearson how you should teach calculus by computer. Similarly, some science things are much better. It's wonderful when you have a computer and you can show people things. And it's always the simple stuff. It's never the complicated stuff that works. Gerald Bracing. There's a growing technology of testing that permits us now to do in nanoseconds things that we shouldn't be doing at all. This is just because we can do it on the computer doesn't mean we should be doing it. This is the major problem. Well, I have a lot more to say, but I'll probably include it in, no matter what questions you ask, I will distort them so that I can say more things than I want to say. I'm going to show you some other factors. I've got some more data for you, but I'll wait with that for a few minutes. Okay, we go on. Message uh, loud and clear, and again in very strong languages. And uh, I think a couple of points that he, he raised is very important. And, and as uh, one of those uh, fancy sitting intellectuals, I, I would try to balance it out a little bit. Uh, he mentioned that uh, corporations has been behind the, the testing movement in the U.S. And I have to say that uh, since uh, Dr. Tong, the director of, uh, of our examination of poetry, is here, we have to say that this is. It is a non-profit making public organization uh, who is not there for the profit and I'm sure he's, he will feel that his job it will be uh, a lot easier if he is not made to administer the, the TSA. Uh, but, 
there are of course a lot of uh, profits to be made there, publishers uh, especially, and then uh, you know in the annual book fair in Hong Kong, the only books that are being uh, will be killed up by uh, buyers are those TSA supplementary exercises. And uh, each year, I think an average uh, primary student family will have to pay for well, I did uh, about six hundred, seven hundred dollars for the uh, those supplementary exercises. You like it or not? Um, the other issue that uh, he raised, I think, well, as a sociologist, it's very important is the, in, in the, the effect or the interaction effect with the inequality in the society and how does it affect disadvantaged students. And of course, uh, again, I would say that Hong Kong may not be a, have the same kind of uh, extent of inequality or poverty in some of the uh, urban areas in the U.S., but uh, we don't have uh, the, that kind of extent of race issue in the U.S., but we do have a large group of also uh, some schools are a high concentration of disadvantaged students, new arrivals from the mainland, um, minority students, SEN students, and all, all sorts of backgrounds that may have uh, special implications for the uh, administration of the standardized tests and then its effects on teaching and learning. So there's some of the, the issues. And, and another point about that that Stephen raised is very important is uh, the effect on teachers. And uh, what does it reflect on our belief about how poor our teachers and schools are doing? I think that's one thing that's very important for us to think about when we are talking about uh, standardized tests in Hong Kong. And, and I, that's why we are having our second speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Christina Erika Akrila, uh, on uh, the Phoenix experience. We all know that uh, when, whenever we talk about standardized tests, we, we are saying that well, we have it everywhere. It's a global trend. Uh, but people do it differently in different places and with different reactions. We now know that the US uh, citizens and parents and, and, and schools are, are, are having some discussions and be thinking about the necessity for it. Uh, and Finland also has certain kind of standardized assessment uh, during their primary education years. And uh, But from what we know very superficially that it doesn't lead to the kind of during and testing regime that we saw in Hong Kong and perhaps also in the US. So that's why uh, we have Christina here who introduced us to the Finnish experience and how they might have done it right or at least done it differently. Finnish people place great value on education. Equal opportunities, professional teachers, and a student-centered approach lie at the heart of learning. Research shows that three quarters of the Finnish population believe that the Finnish comprehensive school system is one of the most noteworthy factors in Finnish history and creates a foundation for well-being. One of the key tenets of the Finnish education system is that it offers everybody equal opportunities for learning, irrespective of domicile, sex, socioeconomic status, or linguistic and cultural background. The school network is regionally extensive. Basic education is completely free of charge, including instruction, school materials, school meals, health care, dental care, commuting, special needs education, and remedial teaching. The gap between the top and bottom performing schools in Finland is one of the narrowest in the world. The education system gives each student great flexibility. Binding decisions are not expected to be made at an early stage. Instead, the road all the way to tertiary education is untracked, with none of the paths leading to a dead end.
Academically qualified professional teachers at all levels of education support and encourage students to succeed in school. Teachers from pre-primary class all the way to university level are highly qualified and committed. Teachers are required to have a master's degree, including pedagogical studies and teaching practice. Since the teaching profession is very popular in Finland, universities can select the most motivated and talented applicants. Teachers are highly respected professionals, work independently, and enjoy professional autonomy. The education system is flexible, and its administration is strongly based on school autonomy and support. Centralized steering takes place by means of objectives specified in legislation, and by means of the national core curriculum. Local authorities are responsible for organizing and implementing education and the national objectives. Beyond that, schools and teachers have wide autonomy in how they provide instruction and what its contents are. A national core curriculum is drawn up as a skeleton curriculum for all comprehensive school. Being a framework, it leaves education providers flexibility to organize instruction in the most expedient way in each part of the country. This devolved educational system builds on curricula drawn up and executed at the local level, allowing schools and teachers to exercise professional judgment and discretion in selecting materials and designing instruction tailored to the needs of their students. The average class size in basic education is 20 pupils, and pupils and students are given fewer hours of instruction than in other countries. Moreover, Good learning outcomes are achieved at just average expense. Students take an active role in designing their own learning activities. Students work collaboratively in teams and actively engage with their teachers and their learning environment. Each student's learning and welfare is extensively supported and tailored to individual needs, and guidelines for this purpose are specified in the National Core Curriculum. Students are offered educational guidance in choosing their school paths in education. There are no national authorities for testing learning outcomes, nor are there any ranking lists. Moreover, there is no school inspectorate. The evaluation of learning outcomes is based on national surveys. The aim is to produce information that helps both schools and students to develop. Administrative organs at different organizational levels collaborate actively between schools and between social actors and schools to further enhance the school system. To secure strong support for development measures, education authorities work in close cooperation with teachers' organizations and associations and with school leadership organizations. Student performance in Finnish primary and lower secondary schools is one of the best in the world. Finnish students' proficiency in reading, mathematics and science in the international PISA assessments has ranked among the best from year to year. Average mathematical literacy among Finnish school students ranked in 12th place among the 65 participating countries in the PISA 2012 assessment. Reading and science literacy have also deteriorated markedly. Finnish students are still among the best in OECD countries, but this downward turn gives cause for serious concern. The PISA assessment organized by the OECD evaluates how well 15-year-olds master the skills and knowledge they will need in society and in working life, and to safeguard their development and a good quality of life. The PISA assessment evaluates students' knowledge and skills in situations that reflect ordinary, real-life experiences as closely as possible. In a sample of 45 countries assessing the proficiency of reading literacy of fourth grade students, Finland came in second place together with Russia. In a sample of 50 countries, Finnish fourth grade students' competence in mathematics reached eighth place. Finland ranked fifth among the OECD countries and third among the European countries. Student achievement in science among fourth grade students in Finland was the third best in the world among the 50 participating countries.
wanted to show you this video because I found it from the Ministry of Education's page. So each one of you can see it again if you want. And I think it, it summed up very much more than I would have said in this time, given time. Uh, but it was clearly made for foreign uh, audience in the sense that it uh, said very much about the accomplishments of Finnish students have done or have achieved in these international tests. We don't concentrate on that so much inside Finland, uh, inside the education sector. I have a presentation, I mean, I'm going to highlight some of the same things that you already heard in, on the video, uh, because we all know that repetition is the main thing in education, so I'll, I'll come up with some similar, th same things again in this presentation which was made uh, after the PISA 2009 success. So, there are many things on this presentation and on this video that we don't think about in real life education um, activities in Finland, because it's obvious for us. We have grown up in that society that respects education and that thinks that education is our way for better life. It, it's uh, investing in our future. But because, to our own amazement, we were quite uh, doing quite well in PISA 9, people started to pay attention to Finland and ask us all these questions. What is your success? How did you do it? What are you doing in Finland? What do you put in your tap water to make your students do so well? Well, my general answer tends to be, you all know how difficult language Finnish is. It's only five million of us in the world who can speak it. So that's why we're so talented. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about the PISA results or PISA success, but in this presentation, somebody else has put along uh, the main things that we um, emphasize in our education system. So let's see what, what I have here. Let's skip the PISA results and go to the background information in this context. So one essential thing in our education system is equal opportunities. So it is, education is um, available for everybody. Um, irrespective of, of your background, where you come from. And the basic education is for all between 7 and 16 years. So 9 years of comprehensive school. And usually you go to the nearest school that's assigned to you. There's very little school shopping in Finland. It has, has just recently come to us in the big cities. But, and then basically some students, uh, some families um, opt to choose the school based on some special program they have. Uh, the school network is regionally extensive, of course, in New Finland we have some um, budgetary issues that have caused to close down some schools in remote areas, but uh, usually everybody goes to the nearest school. So it varies where you live. But of course, even the uh, school, uh, going to school, that's covered in terms of finances. So, um, and basic education is completely free of charge. So it includes all the instruction, the materials, the meals, the health care, the dental care, the commuting, special needs, education, and remedial teaching. This means we take care of the child as a whole. And like the previous uh, presenter was mentioning, if you're hungry, if you have to go to the bathroom, you can't concentrate on your, what you're learning. <coughs> then, of course, one of the best medicine uh, how, to, how to do good education is to have competent teachers. On all school levels, our teachers have a master's degree, at least. And they are very committed. 
but not only because they have a university degree, but during their um, study time, they also do training within a real school. Um, and teaching profession is quite popular. It's very hard to get in. We used to have, um, how do you say, it was easier for males to come in. They had a quota, but not anymore because of equal opportunities. <laughs> and, yeah. and teachers uh, are very well trusted. We trust their professionalism. We trust that once they've gone through this teacher education, and since they got into the program, they're very committed. They have the ethos of doing something what's best for the, for the young people and to prepare them for the future. So they have very strong autonomy in the schools and as teachers in their profession. Then, of course, we have also um, student counseling and support system within the schools. So we, we take care of the welfare of, of students in many, many ways. Um, special needs education is mainly integrated into regular education as far as possible. We try to um, enable support as much as possible so that everybody could go in a regular school. We have guidance counselors to help upper grade students in their choice. And um, in education practice, the students are in the center of the operation. The learning is the main thing we do in schools. It has changed since my own um, my own academic or and professional time. When I used to, when I went to school, teaching was in the center, but now it's all about learning. The whole point of evaluation in Finnish education is that it helps the professionals to support the learning in schools. So it's, it gives feedback to the students, it gives feedback to the teachers, how are the students learning? So it's very supportive by nature. And the aim is to, is to produce information that helps the development. And there are no national testing of learning outcomes and school ranking lists are not acceptable. We have a TV um, network that um, does high school ranking lists that's rather new and we're not too happy about it. It's not an official list and we can find uh, reasons why the list looks like how it does. So that's not uh, commonly accepted or acceptable in our country. We think that every school is a good school. So we have a rather flexible system based on empowerment. The administration from all levels, we feel that uh, we have a common goal. So from the Ministry of Education, from the National Board of Education, that's the um, operative office um, responsible for the development of, of education, and the municipality that actually takes care of organizing education and the schools. We all work to the same direction. I'm sure the homogeneity of our, our country has something to do with this and the whole culture being so homogeneous. It's been easier for us to direct to the same direction. Um, Well, this is actually about the cooperation. So, we uh, spent a lot of time in building partnerships. And it starts from, from the classroom. We encourage the students to work together in teams or with their peers. And we also encourage the teachers nowadays to work together. 
as small teams or at least as peers. And within the school, usually, um, we have this um, notion that it takes a village to raise a child. Um, so that they're everybody's children, they're everybody's students. That's at least what we try to push as a mindset in schools. Um, and also, in national level, the education authorities and the unions try to work together uh, for the improvement of education. So we always have to negotiate with the unions, which are rather strong in Finland. But that has, that has brought sort of strong commitment from the society as well. So that brings back to the issue where my, um, where my fellow panelists started, that actually education has to be in the core of the society, and that it, that it um, does in Finland. The Finnish society very strongly favors education, and everybody respects and has trust on our education system. So, and it also, there's a political consensus to back up our education. So if I summarize, the function of evaluation in Finland is to support the development of education and on the other hand, to improve the conditions of learning. Thank you. I think the, the, the uh, value of learning from others' experience that is that even if it is a society is completely different from ours, uh, that there's something that we can learn that at least we can dream of what is possible. Okay, we may not have it in, in two, three, four decades or centuries. You know? That's something. That we have to work on it, but still, you know, we now know that uh, Finland has no national regime of testing. Uh, the best attitudes that they have now, perhaps, is that no, we have PISA, we do it, but we don't worry about it. Is that something that we can do here? I think that's something that we need, and, and, and the high level of trust and respect they have for teachers. A lot of us here are teachers ourselves. Uh, do we feel the same in Hong Kong? Do we feel the same attitude towards our teachers and schools in Hong Kong under the current system? That's something that we have to work on. That's something that we have to think about. And uh, then our next panelist will give us more insight. I'm sure as someone who is in the business for, of administering a, uh, a, one of the largest scale standardized tests in Hong Kong, uh, the PISA project uh, since the year 2000. Uh, so he, she has been in this business for so long that now she has enough experience to rethink what the whole business is like and should be like. And so we invite uh, Professor Esther Hall to come to the panel and, and uh, <coughs> share with us. Thank you. Research, not an international competition. That's why I really want to protect this uh, international project, the PISA, as a very low stake assessment, and hope that won't ruin the uh, our students, uh, like the t uh, like the uh, TSA. So I think this is the main point that I always want to raise the issues that we should not. Um, misuse international or national assessment because they are system level assessment, system level. But if we shift 
will be abused the unit of analysis from system level to school level. That will hurt the schools, like chasing the dog, making pizza a, uh, a racehorse uh, competition. And then, uh, in, in fact, Chinese society always have this gene, always for so many years that we are crazy about tests, we are crazy about assessment, we are crazy about proper examination. So every kind of assessment test can become so high stick that will ruin the life of our students, make their anxieties too high, and really make uh, the parents' uh, life more difficult. And at the end of the day, I'll show you some evidence that high stick testing will um, hurt not only the uh, teaching and learning process, but really hurt the, the kind of key competency that we really, really need for our students for the 21st century. So I'm really glad to have the first two guest speakers to have the, this very insightful background. That, that is a good, very important warning from Steve. And then and, and there's a very uh, insightful picture that we really want to uh, uh, have that uh, good uh, scenario like Finland. Although every one of you may be a bit uh, curious about why the 2012 Finland get into a, a, a rank that is not so good. But one of my guests is that uh, they are too busy to entertain all uh, us uh, <laughs> visitors. So they are, not, they, they, they are distracted by us. from two articles written in Chinese that I want the general public that, uh, that what is the real meaning of PISA, International Study PISA, that is really about learning and that is really about nurturing young people. So this, this paper, uh, this article written to respond to some, some of the uh, general public wanting to Actually, it's not general public. Some particular uh, scholars uh, want to attribute <coughs> PISA score to particular policy or particular policy makers. That doesn't make sense. Because any kind of results like PISA is a culmination uh, effort of all the stakeholders in the, in the basic education system. Basic education system. So I would like to emphasize that PISA have their own uh, values because they emphasize Nurturing key competency in many aspects for learning and nurturing young people. But PISA score can also be abused, like the TSA scores. Both PISA and <coughs> TSA are actually system level assessment, as I said before. But then in, during the process, we will use this score to identify individual schools. So for TSA, uh, the government has individual school ID, so they can really abuse it, not just misuse it, to make school accountable for the percentage correct report every year to the individual school. But that is not fair, particularly for TSA, because in, in the primary level, all students are entering their school uh, by residential uh, criteria. So all schools will have very different uh, family background. All schools will have students from very different family background, like what Steve just said. If you have students that are from poverty, it's not, it's not likely that you can have the percentage correct the, uh, like the average school. So, but once the government have this school ID, that gives them the in incentives to use it in many different ways, we never know. So that is a problem if we release the school ID in this way. The PISA crisis is the same, as I, as I talk in this article, that um, in 2018, the government tender asked, uh, 
those bid for this tender to collect school ID and submit to the government. So it's, a, it's another risk that uh, the government can misuse uh, PISA data, STSA. So that's why I think if the case like that, that will make this system level uh, assessment very high stick, and then you will see the consequence of high stick testing in this uh, Chinese society like Hong Kong. In 2012, United Kingdom have a uh, educational ad make PISA mandatory. In 2014, a group of uh, international scholars, including Stephen Ball, uh, Henry J. Ross, uh, talk about write an open letter to Andres Slider, the, uh, the leader of the PISA since 2000. I, I know him for a long time because I conduct this PISA study in Hong Kong for six cycles. They said PISA tests are damaging education worldwide. They have a lot of different points. I just uh, take summarize some of the major ones. They said, while standardized testing has been used in many nations for decades, PISA has contributed to the escalation in such testing and a dramatically increased reliance on quantitative measures. So this becomes a very important, not the only one, the most important one measures of the ranking of the average score in math, reading, science, every three years. And this emphasizes on the narrow range of measurable aspects of education, make, make the attention, uh, take the attention away from the less measurable and more immeasurable educational objectives like physical, moral, civic, artistic development, our student self-concept, anxiety, whatever. This all non-cutting problems are less emphasized anymore because every side, every three years, when they report this uh, international. Uh, results, the media always focus on the ranking. And in educational policy, PISA becomes, uh, with this every three years assessment cycle, it has caused a shift of attention to this short term fix. You now, in Australia, in 2013, they have another educational ad saying that they want, they're racing to the top. They say, race to the top five in Australia. So it becomes a kind of education policy in Australia. So it, how, how comes? So this kind of new PISA regime with its contribution, is, if its continuous cycle of global testing actually really harms our children and privilege our classroom. And even de-skill the teachers, like what Steve say, and then, um, and then also endanger well-being of stu students and teachers. So when, it, when we talk about PISA, it, it seems to, talking about the, the, T, the TSA. We are happening right now in Hong Kong. When you heard the voice of the, uh, the teachers and you heard the voice of uh, the parents. But why? We have so many examinations and assessments. So internationally, we have two system level, uh, another, so two system level assessments, international like PISA, national like uh, uh, TSA. And then we have uh, one very high state of examination, we call public examination. And then in order to um, make the public examination more uh, valid in, in measuring something, not cannot be um, assessed by pen, paper, and pencil, we will need some other like suit based assessment. So I will, I will give you a, have a comprehensive view of what happening in Hong Kong. So this is the whole assessment system in Hong Kong. On this side, you can see the territory right. That means that uh, locally, we have this system level analysis start from primary three, primary six, secondary three. We have this uh, system level assessment of the reading of the Chinese English mathematics. And then what, the, what our parents really want to stop is this part, the uh, primary three TSA. And the high stake examination is here. But in secondary six, we will have a public examination, the Hong Kong Diploma of Secondary Education. And then on this side, we have a lot of international benchmarking assessment, like here you see the uh, TIMS, ICCS, PISA, uh, or the PEARLS. 
So actually, we have a very comprehensive assessment system. If we stop the TSA in this little area, that will ruin the whole assessment system. But we, have, we still have a lot of different kinds of surveys to understand the school. Like here, you say school level performance measures, student effective survey, stakeholder survey. All of this can provide information for school and the government to understand the school. So the, the TSA at, secondary, at primary three is not necessary. So I agree with uh, Steve saying that no unnecessary test is very important, particularly for the young stage like primary education. So this is the, the kind of the information we already collect from school. So we have the input information about management and organization, learning and teaching, student support and school evils, evils. And the student performance actually is measured by four different aspects. Non-academic performance, affective development and attitude, special, uh, uh, social development, and the academic performance is only a little part of the 23, uh, the 23 measures. Okay? So I, I don't see why bending the TSA in primary three will be so difficult. Um, in order to have more time that we can really review and discuss together. So in terms of national assessment, Hong Kong starts from grade three, but a lot of the developed countries won't start so in such a low grade, like Japan, Korea, they will start the national assessment in, at uh, grade six. And uh, for the public examination, we say this is the necessary evil, and we, we are changing it, actually. We are changing it from two public examinations to one uh, uh, in 2012. So uh, this test is really high stake for students, also for school. So for school, this is a kind of certification and selection for higher education. For school, we also have a, very, a, a more objective assessment on value-added information that will compare schools of similar background and then they will control for the student academic intake before they compare the school. So, but for TSA, it does not have any control for comparison. So it's not fair to school, particularly for those disadvantaged schools, they have a lot of students from single parenthood, from uh, lower SES, from, uh, from um, an immigrant background. And then this way of analysis have another limitation. It does not provide reason behind the way you edit this. So you have to go back to the, the system level to understand more factors related to the performance. And then it's still only academic. What about other key competencies that we want to nurture the students? So we want to nurture students with key competencies, the real competency, not the competence based assessment in the United States. The real competency for successful life and well-functioning and sustainable societies, as emphasized by OECD in 2002, that's not uh, only academic achievement. We have cognitive part, but using those knowledge to uh, solve daily life problems, like uh, language, math, science, technology, problem solving, all these are tools. And then we have a lot of ass assessment about non cognitive part, like how the students can act autonomously and take responsibility, how they can interact with people from different backgrounds. So uh, for all these key competencies, can the standardized test uh, assess all these quality? Of course not. And then in the, uh, even more new, uh, uh, new version, OECD say about character. Can we measure character? Can we measure empathy, resilience, mindfulness, inclusiveness, curiosity, ethics, courage, leadership? So that's a huge limitation for standardized testing. <coughs> but we are saying these key competencies are the more, more important for students to survive, to be successful in society. So let me tell you some of the observations of high stake testing. This is based on the, uh, uh, the previous several cycles of PISA that I want to know what is the 
um, the consequence of high stake testing on curriculum and heritage. That's actually is happening in Hong Kong. So uh, US may uh, foresee what will happen later on. Like um, in the first visit by OECD in 1982, they already described Hong Kong, this Chinese society, the school having obsessive concerns in testing. And then, Bates in 1996 saying, at all stages, the curriculum, teaching method, and student study, and even life, are focused on the next major assessment. So, for if you have a TSA in primary three, the primary one you start to prepare lightly, and then moving forward. So, this is the scenario in the 1990s. And then, based on some qualitative research, scholars also find Extended system in Hong Kong has become the heavy burden both to students and teachers, of course. You, have, you already experienced it, right? And both teachers and students focus on getting the main point. I think that, that hurts uh, our language teacher. <laughs> getting the main point rather than enjoying the text as a good, to get good answers rather than answer quite carefully with structured argu arguments in the examination. On the <coughs> Chinese New Year, my cousin, it was said to me as uh, um, a very little girl, I, I asked him, do you like uh, TSA? She said, yes. You don't need to read the whole text. You just identify the answer. That is very efficient. She said, yes. Because she learned <coughs> or she de-learned what is really learning. That is terrible. That becomes the new norm. That is kind of new norm we don't want to happen in Hong Kong. There's so many good norms that we want to keep in Hong Kong. <coughs> Not this new norm. Not this kind of de learning new norms. And then um, uh, the curriculum becomes examination oriented, of course, and induce uh, adverse competition among students. So here yeah, I'm going to show you some of the consequences, the possible consequences of this high stake testing, like making PISA or, or TSA so high stake, in addition to the high stake public examination. So the school will uh, even more segregated <coughs> academically and socially. Uh, the students' life will be ruined because they have a lot of homework, a lot of private tutoring. Who benefits? Who benefits? Of course, the publisher of the TSA exercise or the private tutor agency. And the, uh, the learning environment become very competitive. I'll show you the data. And, but the most important is that we are going to have our children, our next generation that have high score but no competency. Why? They have very low self-concept. They have a very high anxiety, even get very good score. And they are not engaged in our school. If they don't engage in our school, they are not engaged in our society. They don't think this, this society belongs to them. So this is the, uh, the information about uh, 2003 in ISA. That you can see this, there's, there's an index about the per, uh, percentage of segregation between schools. Hong Kong is always higher than the OECD average in mathematics, science, reading, and problem solving, all about 40%, 40 okay? But things can improve. Like in 2006, you can see here Hong Kong, the academic segregation is about 36. It's, a, it's improved a little better. But the best is always in it. Academic uh, uh, index, that's me. If you get into the school, you won't find this school is particularly good in academic score than the other one. So Paris is good. Parents feel very good because it, you don't need to to uh, to uh, search or uh, for uh, a very prestigious school from kindergarten. So every school is so good. This is the economic seg uh, segregation. Uh, United States is around here. Hong Kong is here. <coughs> so Hong Kong is uh, even worse than U.S. Even worse than U.S. in terms of <laughs> academic segregation because. We still have the academic segregation in, second, in secondary one, right? We still have um, five banding 
move to three bendings, right? Three bending is still, still detrimental. And I, that's why I really admire uh, Finland. They, they start to have this comprehensive school movement, no, no tracking at all since 1970. And then according to the record, I see when they start this movement, it's really controversial. Not everybody accepts it. Even like for the Hong Kong te school teachers, they find it very difficult when they move from five bendings to three bendings, right? But, but the teachers still accept it and try their very best to cater the learning diversity. So that's why very important we have this current group, Ed Diversity. Please respect the learning diversity of students. Don't track them in basic education because we have enough space to accommodate all students until the higher education. Then we can have the more high stake one, the public examination, the, uh, the necessary role, but it's still to have basic. So Finland is a very good example that they are the best because they have the <coughs> lowest academic segregation and also the lowest social segregation. That means School A and School B have similar social background. That you won't find some particular school in Tin Soi Wai that is really low SES that really make a detrimental effect on the students because they don't have enough family resources and support. And they're accumulating in particular school and then they don't have uh, really double teachers to teach them. So Finland have their various staff, they have this comprehensive school, but they also have a particular program like what uh, Christina say they have this special education for all students. I once heard the Finland scholar say, special education is not special education is not special in Finland. Because almost every kid can have this chance. And about over 50% of the kids of the kids during their learning process will take this service. They are not segregated into, into particular school. They are not segregated in particular class within the school. They are only invited by the teachers to partic in particular time to deal with this particular subject and then let them get back to the, uh, to the uh, normal standard and then they go back to their own class. So that makes a difference. So no segregation, very low uh, 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 academic segregation. And for the United States, the social class segregation is, is more serious than Hong Kong. That is really, really interesting. That is really tell, very consistent with what students say about the property. Wow, another 50 minutes. <laughs> so I'll flip this, flip this uh, slide quickly, show you that our after school homework and tutoring is really a lot. Like, uh, Korean is worse than us, huh? <laughs> and then our non cognitive outcomes, the self concept in reading, we are the bottom, together with Korea. <laughs> um, we, uh, we have this uh, very low self-concept in men as well, it, although we are the, always the top three in the inter international assessment. We have very high anxiety. The circle I take is the, the East Asian countries. So we have high score but very low competency. We are very competitive. We are the top. But we are very in uh, the cooperation index is zero. <laughs> international level, okay? We are highly competitive, but no cooperation. <laughs> so still the engagement. So this is our East Asian countries. So the index is here. School, this is the school um, sense of belongings. Uh, this sign is a very positive sense of belongings. This sign is very low sense of belongings. That is indicator of whether we can engage the heart of our students. So for the uh, y, y axis, this is the, whether we can enjoy, engage them physically. So just like you're, you're sitting here, the still, our students seldom absent or seldom skip class. So we have engaged the body, very high, but not engaged their heart. <laughs> so, so to conclude, um, the international assessment or lesson assessment will become high state if you shift this system level analysis into the school level. And then it is particularly unfair for primary school because you compare school without the ground, without the common ground. And then this kind of testing actually is for the whole comprehensive assessment 
uh, picture, it is only a small part. But people will focus too much on this one and they get other key competencies. So we are letting this tail wake the dog. This tail, not just the assessment, but also, uh, also <coughs> Steve just uh, remind us about the technology. <coughs> Do we make use make good use of technological assessment to feedback, to support the teaching, or do we use the assessment and top technology uh, impose the, uh, on the curriculum and pedagogy? We will wait and see. And then, what, how can we change it? So, I, I think the... How can we change it? First, Keep the international assessment, the national assessment, no stick. Keep the unit of analysis at the system level. No need to identify individual school. For PISA, for TSA, so that there's no incentive for the government to compare. And then, I, I think Hong Kong should join the US movement. No unnecessary testing. The NATO movement <laughs> from Steve and then really creates the space to nurture the competency, the soft skills, the passion, and the <coughs> compassion of our students. And then really review the roles of all kinds of exams and tests on the student learning, particularly when a test is hurting the children at a very young age, what should we do as a responsive adults? This adults is not just the parents, it includes the teacher, school, administr school administrators, principals, uh, policymakers and scholars. And the last time, let's see. Oh, this is the last one. So I think um, I really appreciate Finland that they really respect the teaching professions, the, uh, the parents' needs and the children. And then I think um, they should have the freedom to choose what to do how to be, who to be, and parents in this particular group at diversity really want to understand why. Why there's non-stop testing and drilling? And they want to be understood. They suffer, their children suffer, and then is it possible to really opt out of all unnecessary tests? So let's work together and really discuss the policy interactively and let schools and parents and autonomous. Thank you. Okay, so now we can invite the three panelists to be on the stage. And we start our discussion. Uh, one thing that we have to be very clear is that we are not starting a Finland work here. Uh, it's not a conspiracy to establish a cult on the Finnish board. They must have done something right. Uh, they have also have their own fair share of problems. Uh, the thing is that we learn from each other and start to think about our own problems. Uh, the, the three cases here are very, very interesting. And, uh, you line them up according to their PISA score. We are definitely on top. Finland has been uh, on up and down, uh, but close to the top. Uh, US is middle -ish. Okay. But if you think about the amount of time that our students put into their work, you waited, you imagine that you, we, we, as education, we don't want to compare schools to factories. But if you have three factories, that uh, one has a, a good output with the standard working hour, and other one has a better output but with a lot of overtime work. Which one is the better factor? Which one is more productive? That's something that uh, we have to put in the context, and uh, that Stephen also reminded us. You know, US is in the middle, but. They have a very different society, and I'm sure they may not have the kind of after-school drilling and exercise that we have to the extent that we have in Hong Kong. So again, weighted by the amount of hours of work that students put in, they probably are doing pretty well. 
So that's the kind of things that we have to put into context when we think about our Hong Kong issues. Now, there's no disguise that the ad diversity is not has their own position on, on satellite testing, TSA, and all that. So our panelists are all speaking in one bit more or less similar voice. Uh, that's why we have invited uh, people from the community, from the profession, that might have different opinions uh, on the matter. So I would invite people, colleagues here, who might want to say something differently first, before I revert to some of the four speakers who might have other things to say. We have uh, people from other parts of the world as well, and also other cases from Finland. Yes. Katie, I'm sure I will be calling you if you are not <laughs> putting yourself forward. Uh, Professor Katie Hao from uh, CUHK. Let me speak my head out. Uh, first, to Stephen, you advocate, you attribute partly U.S. poor international performance to poverty. So, by the same logic, will China look even much better if poverty is taken into consideration? If question two. Will China look uh, much better? Much yeah. better. If, if, if we control poverty. for poverty. Oh, yeah. Of course. Second. Everybody's going to look better if we control for poverty. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's going to look then even then better if we get rid of poverty. Yes. <laughs> there are three about poverty. Question two. Uh, we understand that, like even Guangdong, which is doing very good in, uh, in China, is participating in 2015 ESA. So will you speculate, the result has not been out yet, would you speculate China, like Guangdong, the, some of the weakest uh, products in China, will be doing worse than US? Question three. You and Esther has... Yeah, I've got to keep track of all these questions. Okay. <laughs> How, how many do you have? Uh, Seven, eight? <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, a lot of people challenge that uh, Shanghai is not representative. So China has like, all products participating. So will all those uh, people who challenge China, uh, Shanghai not representative, will they speculate that like one of some of the weakest parts in China will be, will be doing very poorly? Number three, you and actually, I heard a lot. You and Esther actually quote uh, Pisa Pearl's questionnaire suggesting top achieving countries have low interest competence. But a lot of research are OECD itself included. And recent research argue that a point three on a four point scale mean different things in different countries. So they are not comfortable. And actually, a recent study showed that poor reading performing countries actually have lower, lower interest after adjusting for the use of scales. Do you think interest self concept across countries can really be compared? As you have done. Or Katrina. Finland is doing quite well. And we heard formally or informally from even from Greenland government that there is a great resistance from teachers and unions in Finland to receive educational reform. How would you comment on that? Okay, let me start with your point number 33. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> number 47. I think some of the questions for ESA are two questions. <laughs> <laughs> is not a good tool to compare to. You can't, it's not a representative sample from school. You can never use PISA data to compare to. It's not a weak tool. So there's no point to, to speculate that government can use that kind of data to compare to. My knowledge from the OECD PISA director is that collecting student identified is common across many developed countries. Because we can send PISA performance to earlier like their grade 6, or future test performance, like their school university entrance exam, for policy research. So the Hong Kong government is just doing what other developed countries are doing. Are we over anxious? Thank you. Okay, I'll start with number 87. <laughs> um, I'm very well aware that definitions of poverty vary 
even within countries. Here in Hong Kong, for example, there's a controversy whether you define poverty as, as anything beneath the median versus what people can do with their lives outside of school, and you get different results. What you have to do in research, I think, is look at the big picture. When you see results that are the same, no matter how it's defined, then you have something. The relationship of poverty and school performance, it varies depending on the measure, of course, and the test, but it's always there. People can say it's small, it's large, but it's always there. Not only that, the components of poverty, the consequences of poverty, hunger, lack of health care, lack of access to books, lead poisoning, those things are consistent everywhere. So yes, poverty is the big issue no matter where. Another piece of evidence that we can't trust individual test scores like PISA, let's look at pearls. I have permission to talk about yeah. pearls, right? Okay, straighten that out. If you take a look at your handout, one more time, at the very end, I'm, I'm, I'm supporting your point. You can't really trust individual test scores, individual definitions, but you have to look at the big picture. Here's a, an analysis of pearls that questions my results. Okay? Uh, this is a, a result of, in, of our a virtual relationship I've had with uh, Kai Lo, who's in the first row here, who's brought me here this time, uh, where we were looking at pearl scores, and we found something very interesting. These are all countries, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Italy, Singapore, that did very well on pearls. They did spectacularly well. In fact, Hong Kong was number one in the world. And these are all countries where poverty seemed to be low. This is using the um, Human Development Index. And we found something very interesting. We compared these four countries to other high-scoring, low-poverty countries. And we found, despite the high test scores, people didn't like to read. The children didn't like to read. Even worse, the parents didn't like to read. Whoa, what's going on here? Well, <clears throat> here is our conjecture. I love the word conjecture. I learned this again from my son, the mathematician. Conjecture is when you have a hypothesis, but you're not sure that it's true. If people find counter evidence, you can always say, oh, it's just a conjecture, and you're kind of less responsible. So I'll call this a conjecture, but it consists with the data that Esther put up for us, absolutely. <clears throat> we, our conjecture is this. You get a high pearl score, the normal way is by reading a lot, pleasure reading. And this is what our research says everywhere. People who read more for pleasure do well on these tests, they can't help it. They acquire the vocabulary, they acquire the grammatical structures, etc. But in these countries, they're taking alternative ways. Um, they're not doing it by self-selected reading. They're doing it through required reading and through test preparation. Test preparation is like putting a match, a fire, under the thermometer and claiming that you raise the temperature of the room by giving students strategies for doing well on these tests, by telling them to look out for tricky questions, telling them make sure you don't turn two pages at once, back in the days when we used pages, etc. This is a problem. This is a very serious problem. We get high scores without real confidence, which is dangerous because it means the kids don't like to read. When they become parents, they don't like to read, and it means their real literacy level is not very high. So I am confirming your suspicions with this. This is something we really have to watch out for. In fact, despite low poverty, we're still we're stuck at high poverty, we can still get scores if we cheat. And the push for high scores, as Esther pointed out, is going to lead to this false kind of achievement, which is going to be a disaster. That's the result of taking these test scores too seriously. My colleague in the United States, Alfie Cohn, has commented on this. He says that the test scores should be reported by the media in the sports section. <laughs> so yes, what you said should be taken into consideration. OK, Christine? Oh. Well, I'm trying to understand the question number 97. Um, you were 
commenting or asking if, um, ha if there is resistance for uh, educational reform by unions in Finland. Uh, are you talking about the reform to come uh, when we are getting a new curriculum in 2016? I didn't quite get the uh, yes, point. I think, I think I, I, in form you heard that uh, Finland government are complaining that because of your good performance, outstanding performance, so teachers and unions are resistant to change. Because we are so good? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's my impression, correct? Um, well, um, that's a, maybe some, somebody has that opinion because you've got that impression. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I think we all have, uh, we recognize the need to um, do a reform. And we're, we're going to have a curriculum reform uh, to change the, the concentrate more on, how do we call it, we have a reform that will have a, uh, to emphasize broad-based competencies and the challenge of digitalization. So somehow we'd like to deal with the digitalization. We're not saying that everything should be online, but how do we live with the changing world? And how does school take to account what's happening in non-formal education? We can't limit education anymore within the school uh, buildings. It, education is happening all the time. Our learning is happening all the time and everywhere. How can we deal with that within the education system? So we're trying to uh, incorporate that in our school um, program. And also, um, we're talking about broad-based competencies, not about separate subjects anymore that much. We'd like to um, ma make more real-life relevance in what's taught in schools. And I think pretty much everybody is in favor of these changes, to my understanding. Krishna, please, no question. Um, pick something between 50 and 100. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, but I, I think I get one important question is about the, uh, the uh, identifying individual school. And um, so the rationale you tell me is that Given that other developing country, developed countries do the same, we do it. So it seems somewhat like uh, when we're making a decision on policy, the ground is just, it's not a solid uh, evidence. It's not a, a good rationale to do it. To do it. So given the very successful uh, PISA study, to keep it as a research, so keeping uh, stu uh, school ID confidential to individual school is very important. And um, as you said, individual school score can't be aggregated because it's cut across so many different grade levels. What is the use for the government to identify individual school? Given the uh, evidence of the experience of TSA, it even give us a observation that if we move to this direction, it's likely that PISA will become another high state testing. So I think um, as researcher, we will really want to keep our integrity, our promise to the, uh, our secondary school, and then we really want to keep it as a research rather than a competition. That uh, the scenario of our students is worse enough. I don't want it to make it even worse. Okay, we have one, two, three, four, I see, and uh, Dr. Tong, are you going to <laughs> speak on how actually uh, public TSA uh, feedback into the teaching and learning courses, how it's been used uh, productively, I suppose? Okay, uh, okay. One question, in terms of, was not, hello? Okay. In terms of parent-child reading aloud during early childhood within Hong Kong, what can we do as researchers, educators, to promote an interest in pleasure reading within the home, given the short time span of most working parents within Hong Kong, to promote consistent routines of 
parent-child reading aloud with their children during early childhood. Thank you. But I have one date I want to add. Um, uh, according to our uh, uh, the PISA research, every day you, if you have 30 minutes of reading with a child, the kind of uh, uh, reading web science and problem solving will increase substantially and very significant. So how to make it happen? <laughs> Let me give two answers. Uh, first of all, what the research says over and over again is that children who are read to more do better at everything. Uh, just about, they get excited about books, uh, they do larger vocabularies, etc. And it doesn't matter where it happens. It can happen at school as well as at home. In terms of at home, I want to tell you about one exciting project. It's a group called Reach Out and Read. And they are just, you've heard of them, they're absolutely wonderful. What they do is they go to hospitals in high poverty areas and they find children, families who bring their children in for well child visits. It's got to be a well child visit. If the child's sick, it's not going to work. Okay? In the emergency room, it's not going to work. When the parents and the children are in the waiting room, a member of Reach Out and Read comes and reads to the children and talks a little to the parents about it. The pediatrician then gives the family one free book. They have published study after study after study. If you go to my web page, sdcrashen.com, I have a, a, a paper reviewing their research. Just that one book, once a year, closes the gap between the rich and poor anywhere from 25% to 50%. If we do it even a little, it's going to help. So I have two answers. Do it a little if you don't have a lot. You know, parents, parents of poverty, like I'm so glad you said that, they are overwhelmed with responsibility. Some of them work two jobs, they just don't have time. And I, it, life is tough. But even a little bit is going to help. And if you do it at school, it's going to help even more. If we make sure it happens at school, and we're not doing test prep, but we're reading stories, it's going to be fabulous. The work I've done on read-alouds, I've looked at all the literature on what happens when we try to pump it up and make it more effective. Like, let's look and see how this word is spelled. Let's look at this pronunciation. Uh, do you know what this means? No, stick to the story. The most effective is when the parents and the children get excited about the story, which means it has to be a story that the parent likes. So that's my answer. It's a little helpful. I think one of the PISA report also with the title Last Week Demo Story, right? Pardon? There's one of PISA uh, OECD yeah. issued by OECD a PISA report with the title Last Week Demo Story. And highly emphasizing early reading for the effect on, on, on the child learning. Okay, so uh, we have a, a couple of Finnish guests here who might want to, we want to finish off with the Finnish discussion. Uh, before we come back to perhaps to Hong Kong, we have uh, Dr. Mika Tiran, uh, a diplomat posted in Beijing from the Finnish government, and who might want to tell us how is Finland, the Finnish model is being perceived in China, or some of his own experience being there. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? I, I just have to tell you how much I love to be a thing in Asia, in, in China, because everywhere they come to ask me, oh, you are from Finland, Finland and peace. So that's a really an issue here. And I, I, I find, can you read can you? <laughs> Yeah, I was just telling, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. I was just telling how much I love to be here in, in Asia, in, in China and in Hong Kong as a thing, because this PISA and this testing issue is so hot here, and I, I, I really love this discussion. This is a really important issue. I, I remember when this PISA hysteria started in, in, even in Finland, I knew nothing about it, actually. And I went to my sons, I have three sons, and I asked them that, uh, what is this PISA? Can you tell me? It's because everybody is talking about it. Because they were in, in, in school at that time. They knew nothing about it. And I asked them, that, did you participate in this test? No, they, they didn't know it really. 
And I asked it, I repeated this question just a few years ago when I came to China, that do you really, did you really make it, uh, make the test? No, well, they didn't know really. So I think this tells something about the culture in Finland, because it's not really built up to, to make any, any fuss about tests. So we started to ask each other in Finland that why we are so successful in education. And we, I, I think we don't really know the answer. I, I think the answer is not within the classroom, it's outside the classroom. It's a systemic, it's cultural thing. So it's just the education. Education, there's nothing so spectacular about education. It's just uh, you, you go to school and you make uh, your scores and you come back home and then you have some coffee. And, and that's it. I mean, it's this. It's nothing. And as Stephen uh, was saying here, that if, if you have welfare society, there's no poverty. You have equality. These are basic things. You don't think about these things too much. And it is very interesting now that PISA, uh, Finland is going down with these PISA tests. I also feel this is very natural because our system is so badly built up to 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 these kind of competencies, competition. So it's not built up for competition. So it's very natural that it is not going to be so high anymore because many other countries are doing better in this competition. But I, I would love to emphasize that, that really there are those things that are not cannot be tested. And as was said here, I think that the, the example that the parents are giving in the family is very important. So if the parents love reading, if they love music, if they love things, the kids also learn to love those things. Otherwise, it's no use. So this is uh, basically all I uh, have to say about this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Stuart first, a uh, member of the Finnish Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, and then the gentleman in the back. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, uh, is it okay if I sit down? Yes, sure. sure. I think uh, one thing is worth pointing out is that uh, I think I'm right that the 2016 curriculum now is going to come out in, in Finland is they're going to increase the number of hours teachers spend teaching art and craft. So things that the children do are now going to be increased in the arts and craft area. So although we're talking about things like education in comparing on computers, digitization, etc., actually doing arts and craft is still really, really important for developing the individual. And that's a great thing that Finland still do. So I imagine, as Mika said, eventually Finland might come down in the small STEM measurement tests, but as a nation you will find it's still number one in innovation. And that's a true measure. Thank you. I have a, a couple of questions and a little comment. Uh, a comment. I'll be quick. Uh, about the U.S. Um, I can't remember your name. Our uh, American friend Stephen uh, kept speaking about the sort of crisis in education and the pressure of destroying the quality of education as a future tense. In Hong Kong, it's very much the present tense. It's already happened. It's been happening for years. And really, we're seeing we're seeing kids jumping from buildings, killing each other, literally, uh, because they cannot stand the pressure. So, so I think we should be speaking about it in the present tense. The two questions, one is for Professor Carl. Um, you listed a number of criticisms of Hong Kong education from as early as 1985, OECD, 1996, 2002. I was interested to see that you didn't mention the Education Bureau itself in 2000 issued a very exciting and progressive education <laughs> reform plan. Um, which, as far as I can see, has not been acted upon, except maybe the TSA, which was introduced as a result of that plan. That plan stressed that we should not have quantitative tests, we should not have pressure and drilling and cramming for students. What, what I see is that most of that test has been abandoned. We see it in rhetoric from the EDB and from the, uh, the, the testing authority that help you go. But in fact, we don't see it in reality. What we see is, this continued high pressure, high stakes, intensive testing and cramming and drilling that doesn't leave students any time for what I would consider real education. So I wonder, would you say that that 2000 uh, education reform plan has failed 
And who should we blame for that failure? Long <laughs> question. Speaking of blaming for failure, I'm sorry to bring it up. But we have some friends from the testing authority sitting in the front row. And I really have a burning question because I watched a, a press conference a few weeks ago in which Mr. Tang uh, said that the TSA is actually research. That you're doing research. <laughs> and I want to know on behalf of my daughter sitting next to me, did you get our consent to use my child as a research subject? <laughs> <laughs> And then I, I guess uh, CS to respond. I, I, let's give it. Uh, yeah, CS person. Yeah, the mic is closer to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, could I just respond to that last bit first? Um, maybe I should say that I used to be a, t a professor in mathematics, and I used to teach a course called um, the misuse of statistics. The book I use is lies, damn lies, and statistics. Of course, the last I look, uh, they have not banned statistics yet from our curriculum. So there are always ways to misuse things, but I don't think that's the reason for uh, 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 not, not using certain useful tools. But I, was, I just heard about this suicide thing. You know, I talked about this with scholars, and a professor in Cambridge sent me this article from World Psychiatry 2006, Global Suicide Rates Among Young People Aged 15 to 19. And Finland has 9.5 suicides out of 100,000, ranked number 22 in the world. Much, much higher than Japan, Hong Kong, or, or, or even Singapore. Uh, so sorry, not Singapore, but Japan and, and Hong Kong. So, I think when you talk about suicide, please, you know, don't jump to conclusions. It's like Stephen's uh, uh, comment earlier. When we read about sensational stories on newspaper, sometimes they, they exaggerate things. So when a teacher commits something wrong, it goes into the front page as if all teachers are morally corrupt. But when a politician does the same, maybe it's only in the sports page perhaps. So I think sometimes we have to take statistics and stories with a pinch of salt. We have to look at the big picture. And I totally agree with uh, Professor Carson that there are ways for misusing certain things. And as policy makers, as educators, we have to be very careful. We have to avoid unintended outcomes from certain policies or changes. But I was hoping that today we would also try to understand, instead of just avoiding misuse of assessment and testing, are there any positive uses for assessment and testing? And I'm pretty sure there are. But unfortunately, we have not been able to uh, spend too much time exploring that area. But at least one thing we have done is to look at the model of Finland. Now, obviously, we are looking at the model of Finland because Finland has been considered a success in education. And what is that evidence of success? So far I've heard it's, it's doing very well in PISA. But again, if we think about it, an education policy takes time to have an impact. So the fact that Finland has done so well in fact, it's ranked number one in the world in the first PISA, in the year 2000. It's presumably because of policies made in the 1980s. But everyone is now rushing to Finland and asking, asking the, the government of Finland, what are you doing now? Which will not only have an effect 15 years later. <coughs> so if we look at the Finland model and say, because they are doing so well in PISA, we should learn from it. But by the same token, we have to learn from Hong Kong. Because as we just saw from all those government videos, Hong Kong runs above Finland. So sometimes we have to understand, we don't cherry pick our statistics. We have to look at the big picture and try to identify things that work for students. And assessment testing, can only play a certain part, certain role. 
it is not the uh, panacea for everything. But it does have its role. And we as educators need to identify that role and try to make as effective use of it as we can and avoid unintended outcomes. So I, that part I fully agree and we have to be very careful. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, while you, you have the mind, maybe you, you elaborate a little bit on how uh, TSA information has been used productively uh, to feedback into school teaching and learning. And, you know, and okay. give well, for you to use I never. <laughs> I don't know I why. Answer I the was, question. Excuse okay. me. You distorted statistics. Why don't you ask your Finnish friends? Is the overall suicide rate higher for adults and for you? What's the suicide rate for 12 and 13 year olds? And please answer my question about the research subject. Okay, I'll answer the. You accuse me of distorting statistics. I think you just massively distorted statistics, and you need to be honest. And okay, speak let me honestly. Let me... Don't lie and sneak around like the government always does here. Please. Now you you you, you okay, get back to you your, your, your okay. question first. Yeah. Well, he asked me about research. I don't, I don't know where that quote comes from. It's from you. I, I never uh, said that TSA is a research. But what, what people said was, in this year, in the year 2016, will be a chance to use the 50 schools tryout to do some research. It was never, I never quoted saying that TSA is the purpose for research. I don't know who, who quoted it, or who reported it, or who misreported it. But that, that's not important. I mean, what's important, what's important is TSA, just like any government or national testing, is only a part of a monitoring of student performance. And that's all there is to it. The more feedback we can provide of these kind of statistics to the schools, to teachers, to educators, for example, <coughs> what Professor Ho has been doing with PISA. Although PISA is not tied to a school, but she has been working very hard to try to extract information and try to learn from it and feedback to schools, feedback to educators. In the same way, what we hope to do, of course, uh, uh, is to do the same with uh, TSA data. Of course, we, the Hong Kong EAA, uh, Hong Kong EAA as an organization to, to implement the TSA, we have not been asked to do any research on the TSA data. Okay, so that's so much we can do. But I do, we, I do agree that if we can make better use of data, then of course we'll be able to uh, help teaching even more. But sometimes we have to make a balance. How do we make better use of data? Well, one use is to have data available to parents to make data available to the students, which is what people do elsewhere. But we have shied away from that for the fear of another misuse of data. Because when you put data in the hands of parents, who knows what evil that could lead to? We don't know, and we have not tried to do that. So there are lots of things that we could do, we may not be doing at the moment, and I think there is always room for discussion and dialogue. So that's all, all I'm asking. Okay, Christina. Um, yes, Christina. Let me try to aggravate both sides of the argument. <laughs> I think this should be an empirical question. Is it worth giving the TSA? This was my letter to the editor of the South China Morning Post, so if it doesn't get published, I'll tell you all about it. Uh, we do know that grades, we have suggestive evidence that grades are a pretty good predictor of future performance. So I recommend this requirement. Anytime we want to give a test to all students, we must show that it's more valuable than grades. That has not been done. That's my recommendation for the next project. The problem is also, do we need to give these tests to everybody? In the United States, they want to test everybody on all subjects all the time, so they'll make more money. And I have pointed out, when you go to the doctor, they don't take all your blood. They take a sample. And from the sample, they can extrapolate the health of the patient. Okay? And I recommend the same policy on testing. 
Let's look at the PISA and the PEARLS. They don't give it to all students. The NAEP, they don't give it to all students. They give it to samples. And they're very good statistical methods for extrapolating from the sample to the population. I would recommend that as a research program. Is it worth it to give the TSA to all kids? Is it better than tests? Are we better off, if we want to get a sample of how kids are doing, are we better off giving it to small samples? Or simply, is it better than the PISA or the PEARLS? So how about that as a way of settling some of these issues and possibly saving some money, time, and stress? Well, yes, uh, CS will tell you that we are exploring the possibility of doing a, a sample test of the version of the TSA. Actually, you can already take a sample that you have now and, and see if it is just as good as the whole thing. Let me do it again. Just a very brief response to a gentleman who raised the questions about uh, the educational reform. Actually, the, the educational reform in Hong Kong is like a storm. And it's very complicated. But the ultimate goals, as stated in the original uh, documents, is about raising our students that they can learn to learn as a lifelong learners. And then uh, PISA data can really provide some uh, timely data to talk about whether this is success or not. But we can't say success or, or fail. Because in certain aspects, the a kind of ac like academic segregation is reducing, but not reduced enough. The, uh, the anxiety is still very high, but the, uh, it's <coughs> reduced a little bit. So we, uh, it's, it's really a very we need a very comprehensive research to, to do it. And then PISA do have the consents from parents and students to conduct the research. So let's keep it as a research. Christina, you want to say anything about the suicide issue? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, but I know we have some problems being a remote country with a lot of darkness and harsh weather. <laughs> and life is very hard in Finland too, but maybe in different respects. So, I, like Mika said, we don't. We try to keep our school sort of a pleasant place and not add to that pressure in schools. Uh, I'm not sure if, um, I know that we have a very high suicide rate, but I'm not sure if it's particular among young people. And perhaps it can't be traced to the school, at least. Okay, uh, but what, but we have a friend. But, 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 yes. One point uh, about uh, Dr. Tang's response. Actually, Hong Kong e, uh, EAA never use or uh, abuse the data they just collect the data scientifically. And they, they never earn money from this uh, assessment. So uh, it, it's very, very clear. But in addition to this TSA, to make it for further analysis, we must have the consent of the parents and students. So for sure. OK. Um, yes. And then, and, and Katie. And, uh, or maybe you shout. <laughs> Hi, my name is Natalie. Uh, nice to meet you all, and thank you so much for all the sharing. I just have a few questions about, say, like the assessments that kind of stuff. I mean, like the PISA, I mean, you're testing for competencies, which are very important to know whether a child will succeed in the future. But then I think even within each competency, isn't there a huge spectrum of, say, what being creative means, what being innovative means? Because, I mean, I grew up not really knowing what I'm very good at, and I'm always like kind of imagine, I like to daydream a lot and all that kind of stuff. But I know that I'm a creative, but I'm not necessarily very good at drawing, I'm not necessarily very good at design, but then now that I've worked in the real world and I realize that actually my creativity comes from being able to connect different things and being able to see how synergies are related to each other, but then how, but then when I was, when I was a kid I thought that I failed at a lot of things because that wasn't a competency that was tested because when they say, oh you have to be very good at English to be successful in life or you have to be very good at reading to be successful in life and I actually was very bad at linguistics, I was very bad at reading and, and I feel like a lot of these assessments and I mean these tests just really demotivates a lot of the children because it puts you in the silo of 
what you're expected to be good at. At the same time, like, you know, in terms of these PISA tests, um, like, who are the ones that, I, I'm curious as to know who are the ones that created these tests, because sometimes I feel that, like, adults think that all these things are very good with children, but then the, but then the children are growing in an age where adults didn't grow up in. So then, is it fair to use the adults' assessments on what they think the children should be good at when, when, when we are, sh when we are, we, when ultimately we want our kids to be successful, right? We want our kids to be happy in life, and for the successful examples, um, what about asking the actual success leaders about what they think these competencies are? I mean, yes, it's a very general, like being creative, being communicative, and all that stuff. But then, what exactly does that mean in the real world terms? And I'm just curious to find out. I mean, is there a better way to assess um, competencies without just doing kind of a PISA test? Like, is there something more qualitative? Is there something that we can put them in an environment and have them kind of go through, you know, more real world kind of examples and stuff? I think these are larger questions than we can, what we can handle today. And uh, perhaps Esther could have uh, a few hours to talk to that <laughs> guest. And, and well, in the interest of economy of time, we, we let our guest first uh, speak, and then maybe we let the panelists run up a bit later. Yeah. And who is the uh, founder of an, a rather alternative entrepreneurial school in Malaysia, and uh, may have some experience to share with us. Uh, thank you very much, um, actually, for this platform to speak on as well. Um, yes, I just want to put a bit of a monkey wrench here because uh, people are talking about uh, you know standardized assessment. My question is, why are we even spending so much time talking about it? Because if you really, really look at what is going on in the universities all over the world, I mean, universities don't have standardized testing. Are we saying that the university degrees do not have any worth? You know, so then why are we placing standardized testing as of such high value at primary or secondary level? Now I come from a country, I mean if, if you're talking, uh, Professor Stephen, if you're talking about United States, then we in Malaysia, we are doomed. You know, we, we start the same platform as Hong Kong and Singapore in, uh, you know, British colonial times, our education system was on par. Over the past 50 years, we've dropped down to number 52 on the PISA rating. And you know what? Honestly, uh, my sister and I, we open our own school. We don't care. We don't care what the PISA rating says. You know, um, at the end of the day, um, I, you know, I was teaching in the Canadian pre-university program, you know, in a college in Taylor's, uh, in Malaysia. And the thing was, I love the program because they don't have standardized testing, all the way from primary all the way to pre-university. And, the, and I know for a fact that some of my students who transferred to um, study and migrated to Canada to study, they, they, they thrive there, you know? So um, why then are we so focused on it, you know? Because after all, in universities, there's no focus on standardized testing there. It's only the entry to it. So what we did in our school was we, we had to, we chose, yes, we, we started the entrepreneurial school. Yes, we are doing the IGCSE curriculum, you know, but that's because if we didn't do it, the parents would not have sent their kids to us. But what we did was, yes, you have an exam, but why are we teaching tests and exams to get to the exams? You don't have to. So we flipped everything around. We have so much fun with the kids, you know, but at the end of the day, they do well in the exams, you know. So people ask, they, they wonder why. Um, we, there, there is checkpoint at year six, uh, year nine. We chose not to do it as a school, even though other international schools uh, have chosen, and that's the point that they're using to, um, to sell their schools. And we chose not to do it. We stand firm by it. You know, parents are asking why you're not doing more of this subject. We make hip hop compulsory in our primary school. You know, we make drama compulsory in our primary school. So I absolutely love everything that, that all three on the panelists are talking about. And if you're talking about taking 15 years to actually get to see the result, no, it takes two years. That's all it takes, two years for you to actually see whether, you know, when you switch out of this very exam-based system to actually see the results. There is no need for a quantitative test to actually find out whether it works or not. You know, we're talking about qualities, we're talking about feelings. All you have to do is look at the children. 
That's all. Okay? So yes, I love what you say. Thank you. Katie? <laughs> Comments. First is that I think we have a wrong focus today. But if we want to change the system, we have to work on a high stake one. So in Hong Kong, in particular, you have to work on a high stake second school placement system, which TSA does not serve that purpose. TSA is a low stake or no stake kind of system by design. Secondly, I think uh, we talk about sampling, but uh, in the world, around the world, it started in 1960. US started with a project which is a system level assessment. But now around the world, there are system level as well as lower level school uh, feedback kind of information system, like the Australian NetBank, uh, like everywhere. I think you can talk always there are two systems. One is the territory wide or country level system. The other level is the school feedback that you monitor the kind of transmissible disease in the country as well as in every hospital. So there are two systems. So separate won't help. Uh, to de uh, decrease the, the whatever pressure on the student if we just take one level because they are always two level of monitoring. Okay, uh,
Now, before I give the floor back to the, the panelists, I, I, since we have a representative from the EDB, I, I wonder whether he or she no, no, would like to stop. I, I don't think it's from a relevant department. Oh, okay, 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 <laughs> good. Then perhaps you let the panelists round up a little bit. I know this is a very, very hot topic and that uh, we are not going to end the debate here. But okay, now that I have the microphone, <laughs> well, if you I, yes. will allow me to speak. Uh, as to your question, I recommend a book by Yong Zhao, Y-O-N-G-Z-H-A-O. It's called Catching Up or Leading the Way. And his thesis is the United States, uh, China is now looking to do what the United States used to do. The United States is now wanting to do what China used to do. So they're going in the opposite direction. China's looking toward more entrepreneurship, creativity and the United States is looking for more standardized testing. In terms of the Americans going out to study other countries, they're only looking to find things that support their own positions that will help them make more money. They're cherry picking, okay? I want to go back to Natalie's point, very important. A couple of things that I think takes the rug out from all of this testing badness and testing fever that we have. People are different. I don't know if you've noticed that. We're all very different, we have different talents. The goal of our life, as some people have said, is to discover your talent. School should help you do that. And as Natalie pointed out, what is valuable today will not be valuable five years from now, ten years from now. We don't know the future. These people think they know, they don't. All we can, you, all we can do, and this is Yong Zhao again, is to help students discover their talents, what they want to do in life, help them develop it, and the world will find a use for it. School is a place to help you discover who you are and what you're good at. And all this testing is categorizing people much too soon, which is why I'm so impressed with the Finnish idea of giving kids time to find out what their interests are. Mm -hmm. I think you posed a tough question to, to capture in a way, but I think the, the Finnish system sort of answers that. And my friend here sort of captured it already. So we have to remember that the function of evaluation in Finland is to support the development of education and on the other hand, the conditions of learning. So the whole purpose to evaluate is to support the learning of a student. And I think who does it best is the teacher who's very close by, and the other adults, and themselves. We have a very uh, strong emphasis on self-evaluation, and also evaluation by their peers and by the sort of the community in a way, because we engage also the families and the parents in the sort of participating in the support or growing of the child. So we communicate with the parents, we have opened up um, all the results um, that, the, that the kid is getting in the school online through a shared uh, platform and where even the child can reach him or herself, not all the information of course, but the parents can reach all the results uh, on time, real, real life time, and also all the teachers put the, all the information there. Um, on a student portfolio. So everything is available. So it's not a big surprise when you get your report card in the end of the school year, what you're getting, because you're already been part of that evaluation yourself. We do have national tests also, but they're not, um, they are sort of samples, because some year we take, um, all six graders will do a mathematics test nationally. And then it gives feedback information for how the nation is doing, how our education is doing. We have that type of things in reading and maths. Every now and then, it's not always the same. The only thing sort of that remains is in the end of comprehensive education and high school education, the matriculation exam before the university. That's the only thing after the academic studies. And that sort of everybody knows of, and that's sort of published. But we don't pub publish, for example, PISA results by schools. We give them back to the school, ask for them to work on it. They don't publish it anyway. It's only the PISA result of Finland is published, but not beyond that. 
So um, we have trust for our educators and for our education system unless we hear something different. I mean, we don't need to do, we don't need to, to get more accountability than that. If there's problems and we find out of them, we'll make a way to support or correct the thing. But of course, we are a small nation and we share a lot of similar backgrounds. But um, we do everyday monitoring in a way. That's my answer. We're happy, we trust it. Oh. Just like we trust the fire department. <laughs> we give them tests all the time. Yeah. And the last one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. A brief response to uh, the young lady that I'm really happy that this is part of uh, talk, talking about the competency is part of your life that you have to survive. You're right. Not everything can be measurable. That just like what we mentioned, there's so many things we can can cannot measure. So, um, for the mechanism of measuring is about uh, by a, a team of experts like our Hong Kong EAA that they really have very uh, good scholars to do it and then to do the trial and then to the main study. So, if you're interested, we can talk about it later. And for the Malaysia ladies, that I totally agree. I write a book chapter about the uh, this area's performance and then Malaysia is taking it very easy. It's part of your your culture that you are so relaxed that you won't take. <laughs> so there's a one scientific paper written by Margaret Ru, Margaret Ru, and uh, she also talked about the effort that when we face the the, the uh, examination, Chinese have the fever for so many years. So whenever we sit for the examination, we are doing very seriously. We we count the percentage of non-rich items. Uh, Australia have a lot. I think the same is for Malaysia. So it, it's like a, they, talk, they take it uh, very, uh, very um, relaxed. So don't, don't just rely on a single uh, data to talk about the whole system. And then if, uh, like if um, PSA is no state, no state, then how about take this unnecessary test no more? And then uh, if you need to use that to uh, do further research, let the parents have the consent, and then let them have the right to opt out. So we are going to join your net and opt out movement. <laughs> well, I'm sure we can continue the discussion on and on. Uh, the time is short and we cannot cover all the uh, issues here, but I will let Ken do a little bit of wrap up before we finish the event today. Sorry if you can just bear with me a moment because there's one more piece of information that has not been able to, to, to tell uh, you all. Because we have a, a member in the audience from Asia Society, they've actually been doing something um, that their Centre for Global Education, they're doing something about global competence. Um, something measuring really what those soft skills we were talking about at an international level and which can be done um, in Hong Kong maybe in the later stage and they've actually kindly produced 50 copies of this and if you'd like to see what it is about um, pick one up and um, so thank you very much because um, <clears throat> it's, it's become a little bit of a heated debate but um, it's the good thing about diversity because we respect different views and we want these views to all come out in one platform and we respect each other's views and then try to come into a solution maybe one day where at least we know each other's standpoint and I think it's very important. So keep the respect and keep the discussion going on and we hope we have some more discussion like this in the future. Thank you very much.